So that is the, that is the group of leaders. That's kind of we 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 would call them elders, but I don't know whether they call themselves elders. And then you have the top leader, which is the, uh, like I said before, the CEO. But in some cases, it's not a CEO. It is actually a monarchy. It goes from father to son. And we have seen that in several churches. Think about uh, Joel Austin. How come Joel Austin is the pastor of the church now? Well, because his father was the pastor of the church before him. And he has this uh, uh, G.R. Ewing smile, uh, looking good enough to, to be an actor in, uh, in one of the uh, soaps in the United States. And then he has this, this uh, people listen to him because he's trained in a certain way. He's not a, a, theolo a theologian, he's not theologically trained as such. But he knows exactly what to say and how to say it. And people hear and believe him. And even his, his books are being sold as being theologically sound. But I don't find them theologically sound. But that is a, what is a, a typical monarchy. It goes from father to son. Same thing happened in, uh, in Crystal Cathedral. And you say, well, Crystal Cathedral is not a, a, it's not a prosperity gospel church. Well, no, <laughs> officially not. In, 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 officially they are reformed. But we will see that is not a reason for not being or not having a prosperity gospel as background. What we know and what we look at when we see what is happening, we see a problem. And that problem is the people in the churches. Because the people in the churches, they are like sheep without a shepherd. And of course, and I hope that will sound uh, very, uh, very familiar to you, but let me read the text that is Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Actually, you should read from 35 on. Uh, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their, in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep. But then he said to his plentiful because of you, ask the Lord therefore to send out workers into the harvest, harvest field. Many of the people in prosperity gospel churches are actually like that. They are sheep without a shepherd. When they want to go and being shepherd, or when they disappear from churches, they are not being they, they, they are not being visited by the, the local elders. They are being visited by some of the other church members saying you have to come back because otherwise you lose your salvation. Instead of seeing wrong with the church and seeing what is wrong with their lives so we need to have eyes and ears open because many of those those people of those churches they will eventually eventually they will fall away from those churches I think it is something like um, 20 years ago, I was in, uh, in Nigeria. And of course, at that moment already, prosperity gospel was all over Nigeria. And I talked to one of the leaders there and I said, you know, we have to prepare. We have to prepare because one day, one day that bubble will burst. And when the bars is there, 
when it breaks and it's spread all over and nobody knows anything anymore and nobody, know, and nobody cares anymore, then we as Christians will be there. And we need to take care of those people who sat in those churches, who were under the leadership of those strange people with strange ideas. And when you say strange in Nigeria, it is really strange. It's absolutely alien to our thinking. It has nothing to do with what we do, what we believe. The order of the cherubim and cherish, uh, seraphim and cherubim, they have, they claim to have 10 million people in Nigeria. That would be one out of 10 Nigerians would be a, a part of that church. You cannot imagine, you cannot imagine what they believe. For example, um, they would have a separate entrance and a separate exit of the church. I was there, and, 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 and since I, I was announced as a pastor, so they let me in. Uh, I had to undo my shoes, and I had to go in. But I've, I think I forgot something, so I went back. Man, 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 man. I went, as I went back to the same door, I came in. How can you be that stupid? Those white people have no idea what they are doing. I still don't know what the, the, the whole idea of this two different, uh, the entrance and the exit, but anyway, that's what they have. They dress in white. I don't know why they dress in white, except for purity reasons, but that is what is happening. Those are people, those are sheep without a shepherd. Someone we met before in the testimony part, he's a missionary in Peru. And he has a problem with missionaries. Because missionaries come and go, and especially American missionaries, they have the tendency to bring not only their family with them, but they also bring what they call short-term missionaries with them. Nothing wrong with the idea, nothing wrong with the system, except what are they bringing? Because a, a missionary, a trained missionary, who goes to the mission field for a longer time, stays there, learns the language and starts a church, he needs to have a balanced theology. A lot of short-term missionaries, the ones who go for, for three weeks or six weeks or three months, or six months, no training necessary. They just come. And whatever they think, whatever they believe, it's being openly given to the people there. And that's the problem, the problem faced by the missionaries, especially here with uh, Jean de Mars in Peru. Men and women are coming down to the mission field and telling those people, people on the mission field, they are poor. You should not be poor. You should be rich. You should be affluent. The people have not enough money to go to a doctor. And if they would have enough money to pay for the, the, the traveling, they would not have money to pay for the doctor themselves, himself. So, and now you're coming there and say, ah, oh, you have to be rich and God is going to give you all these things. People get confused because some missionaries preach this and some missionaries preach something else. The problem afterwards is 
when those people are gone home back to the United States, then the lifelong missionaries, they have to clean up the mess. And they have to teach them reality of the Bible and not the, the um, The, the smile and happy Christians, the ones who clap in their hands and, 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 and joyfully shout, and shout the, the, the louder they shout, uh, the more spiritual they are. Oh, I mean, that's the way they think. In reality, it's just the opposite. What they are bringing is a gospel that is completely alien to what the Bible is teaching, but it's also completely alien to the culture of the people they are trying to reach. If you do that, you're not only confusing the people, you're actually stealing their salvation. How can they know? How can they understand? What, are, what do they have to do and how do they have to do it? So many, many people and many villages are actually closing the door for missionaries don't need, we don't want, we don't want to hear them anymore. We don't believe their lies because they, of course, they found out that it doesn't work. In the jungle of, of Peru, you're not, you never get rich. The only thing you can do is getting poorer and poorer. And if you give your money that you, that you worked for so hard to a missionary that is claiming that when you give it to him, that God will give you more and he's gone to the States and then you're there. You're sitting there in front of your hut. What do I have? Nothing. Because I'm not healed, I'm not healthy, and I'm not wealthy. And that's the reality. On the other hand, you have this, uh, this lifelong, most of the time four years, lifelong missionaries for four years. They learn the language and when they know the language that's probably the last thing they do except um, some of them, and that's the problem, some of them are taking pictures and those pictures go with them to the United States and then they show the pictures, the slideshows, the PowerPoint presentations, to those local churches and the people believe them and so they raise money sometimes for themselves sometimes for others to send not telling them what the real story is or the real message they preached in some cases that's prosperity gospel many missionaries being paid by reformed churches are actually prosperity gospel people. Because the people, the prosperity gospel people, they know that reformed churches, they have money. And they know when they go, and they are supported by those churches, they know they are going to get their money, not only for the, for the first year, but they are going to get the money for the several years in a row. And until the local church discovers what they are doing, unless that, they will just be missionaries preaching that so-called gospel, a gospel that hurts the people, that hurts the churches, that hurts the missionaries that are there working and preaching the real gospel. So what we have to do and it's, it is not, um, it's not hypothetical, it is really what we have to do is not only pray for the people and not only give money to missionaries, but we need to investigate the missionaries before they go. Because many missionaries are there, not because of, uh, of, of calling, but because of the fun wording they, they use, the good preparation they have, the good presentations they can show the churches. 
and when they go and bring a gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ that's the gospel of prosperity a lie to the people there an insult to the people so when you have the chance to meet with a missionary test him try to find out because otherwise he will be sent out and you don't know what he is going to tell we have seen that in many cases let's go to another thing another issue here that is the uh, the idea of money being instrument of blessing and the um, the article was written by someone with a very strange name. His name is John Anwuk Kwetkwe. And that is Nigerian. He is actually from the southeast of Nigeria. You can see that by his name because he has an Igbo name. And I know that because I've, I've been working there for quite a while with uh, other people for uh, to start and run a Bible college but this one is living in the United States and he's he's telling us a story he says when I was at college I went back to my to my local church and I passed by the new expensive car of my pastor. I went to the office and I was met with a sign at the office. And the sign says, we are no longer accepting requests for benevolence due to budgetary constraints. So the pastor had a big car, a new big car, but they could not afford to help a student at the Bible College. And you see the difficulty. You can feel what the man was going through. When, when that car was sold, he could have paid everything he needed for his whole Bible College, the whole time he was in Bible College and even long after that. But the pastor had his big, big car and he had no money. There's nothing wrong with a big car. There's nothing wrong with uh, budgetary constraints. But there's something wrong with the attitude. When this big car and this budgetary constraints when they come together they come together in a, in a local church and that's where the solution should be found the the problem is that money once spent cannot be, send, be, be spent again and so the money is spent so no money available for uh, for Bible college the issue here is you have a pastor who's well to do, nice church, a nice building, a nice office, uh, a nice car. I don't know whether he has a nice house because I don't, I, I don't know. But what I know is that there is a strict friction going on here. You have this pastor and you have this student. If the pastor is so affluent, if he has so much money, so why can he spend his own money to help the student? Because that would be, according to my understanding, a, a logical consequence of the fact that he was being blessed, according to their idea, being blessed by God to have all things. 
And that young student could have celebrated his pastor by saying, my pastor paid for it, but the pastor didn't pay. And the church was being uh, fed prosperity gospel all the time. And so the man had to go back the student had to go back and say, this is not, this is not what God wants me to do. Because the church was run like a kingdom. And the king was the pastor. And everything goes back to the pastor instead of going back to the people in need. People who need money, people who need food, people who need work, people who need it's not going to them. It's, it's, it's being sucked up by the top. Let me read you something from Psalm 32. Psalm 32 It's a wisdom psalm because it's called a muscle. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord does not count against him, in, who, in whose spirit is no deceive or deceit. That is what the people need to understand. That is the problem because that is exactly the opposite of what they are doing. Forgiveness of sins as a declar uh, is, uh, so it's declared and discovered in the context of a church community is a true indicator of God's blessing, not the finances. In other words, don't measure God's love and favor toward you by the money you have or you think you should have. There are a lot of rich people who are going to hell. They are blessed, but they are going to hell. And Jesus said, remember the, the, uh, the camel and the needle? So it's difficult. Romans 5 verse 8, But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what is the favor he is giving us? The favor is eternal life. It's not financial gain. It's not a big car, big house. Money and resources are instruments for propagating this message. Churches and Christians shouldn't be, and I like the idea, shouldn't be in a cul-de-sac uh, of money or cash. For those who do not know what a cul-de-sac is, cul-de-sac is, is a street without, well, it's a one-way street, or no, it's a street with one way in and the same way out. So it, is, it forms like a, a circle and you come back out. And that's the idea here, that you put money in and it never comes out except it goes and disappears in the pockets of the church or of the leadership. And, and, and I know this is, this is tricky when, you say, when I say this, and we should be very careful by say, for, for saying it, but the problem is that so many times it happens. I, I remember um, a story about a, a young boy, very young, I think he was still a child, but I, I'm not sure, maybe 
it was a boy, but uh, he was called to preach, or that's what they said, he was called to preach. And uh, so he was invited in, in churches to preach as a, I think he was 10 or 12 years old, so somewhere between a child and a boy. Um, and at that time, uh, preachers were still wearing suits. So, but the boy was, of course, not as big as a, as a, as a, as a full preacher. So he had a smaller suit. That was not the problem. The problem was the pockets were too small. So when they went to the tailor, they said, you know, you have to make a suit, but you have to make the pockets bigger so more money can go in there. And I'm not kidding. Because that's what people do. They come to that boy, and because his preaching was so good, or that's what they thought it was, they gave him money. They put money in, the, in his pockets. So he had extra pockets in his suits. And, and I'm not saying anything wrong, or I'm, 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 not, I'm not talking about that in, in the sense that it's bad or good. It is, it happened. And that's the problem. People think that's normal. That is not normal. We should be accountable for every cent that comes in to our money. Through our offerings or tithes, if you have tithes. I, I do not believe in tithes as, as, a, as an obligation. I believe in tithes as uh, when you give it, people will be blessed. But for every cent, you're accountable. But don't spend the money in the local kingdoms. Spend the money in the kingdom of God. So I have some questions. So John is giving us questions here. And that's what you have to ask yourself. I will read them out loud. Okay? Here we are. How does the church that you lead view and manage resources. Secondly, what are the things that your congregation celebrates? Changes, are they learning from it? Number three, how long have you been meaning to increase the mission budget? What things have we used our money for? that kept us from doing so. Number four. Why am I so concerned with how many people attend my church? Why is numerical growth so important? And why do I envy other pastors? Number five. Why do I hope that our budget increases this year? Why am I praying for God to provide more resources? I think we have to ask ourselves these questions or, or similar questions. It is questioning our own motivation. Why are we doing what we are doing? And what are we doing with the money that we get? And why is our mission budget always small? And I've been to a church and they had a mission budget and they were never using the mission budget because there was nobody coming to their church to ask for the money. I don't know if you know John Piper, but he's at Bethlehem. Not a city, but the church is called Bethlehem. And he's preaching there for a long time. And one of the things that he brought up that uh, shocked me, at the same time it is a good example. He says that members of the church 
cannot stay on as member of the church if they are married to an unbelieving partner. Uh, that shocked the church. And I was shocked not so much about the idea, but the idea that he was actually saying this in church, that he was saying this is the policy of our church now. We are going to be biblical. And I can only applaud that. And, and the man, John Piper, of course, he wrote, I don't know how many books, at least 12 of them. And he's, all, he's known all over the United States. He has, a, um, a, I think, a weekly program. And he has a website. I, I think it's called Desiring God. And he gives this, this, this biblical explanation He's not, he's not an evangelical evangelical, he's more reformed evangelical. But he has ideas, I mean, you cannot imagine from a reformed person uh, who have that kind of uh, openness to what other people are doing and at the same time saying, okay, but I think for myself and for my church, that's what we do. And so he is bringing a, a, uh, a presentation of, he gives a presentation of the gospel which is balanced. And that's what I like about him. Um, and he says the following, when I read about prosperity preaching churches, my response is, if I were not on the inside of Christianity, I would not want in. In other words, if this message is the message of Jesus, no, thank you. And that is well thought through by him. Because he says that luring in people with the promise of money or the promise of, uh, of, of, uh, of richness or wealth or health that's deceiving, that is deceitful. The Bible says, Luke 14, verse 32, anyone, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Anyone who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. People are plunged into ruin and destruction because of money. First Timothy six, verse nine. So he says, "That is my plea to the preachers of the gospel." And he gives us four. You can almost say four times you find the word philosophy in there. So you have a philosophy of ministry that makes it harder to people to get into heaven. How do people get into heaven? While well, they get into heaven because of the preaching of the gospel and their response to that preaching at the same time the Holy Spirit is working in them, in their heart, in their mind. And they are changed, they are converted. And that conversion is celebrated in baptism. That's what, that's how difficult it is. And then you have prosperity gospel. Come to our church, give your money, come regularly, listen to what the, the leadership has to say, do what, what, what we are doing, uh, then you're saved. Well, I thought the first one was easier than the second one. So it's, it's getting more difficult by prosperity gospel preachers than by the preaching of the gospel itself. In, in Mark 10, verses 23 to 27, you have this story about the camel. 
how can how can a camel go through the to the eye of the needle you can have explanations oh the needle is a is actually a small gate you have to open the camel before you can go through it uh, let me say that may be true I don't know I've um, I've been to, to Jerusalem. Nobody told me anything about the gate called the Eye of the Needle. So, I'm not saying it's not true, I'm just saying I don't know. Other people say it's literally a needle with a hole in it, and of course the, the camel can't go through it. But what is the issue? What is the issue in the whole story? In, in Matthew 10, uh, sorry, in Mark 10. The rich, the kingdom. Jesus looked around and said to his disciple, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples, verse 23, were amazed by his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So the, the saying, all things are possible with God, have nothing to do with, uh, I have a car, and I'm standing in, 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 uh, uh, in a traffic jam, and I said, please, Lord, give my car wings. And he's not giving me wings, or he's not giving my car wings. Because he's not listening to me? No, because I'm doing something, I'm just being silly. So, it has nothing to do with that type of silliness. Give me a better job, but you get a better job. Do you know what happens? Someone else is not that job because of you getting that job when you when you drive around and you need a parking spot and suddenly there's a parking spot available to you and you drive in and say oh god thank you for this parking spot you have to understand someone else behind you wanted that parking spot too and he's not getting it so what are you doing what are you saying nothing is impossible it has to do with the reality that People who are rich are not getting into the kingdom unless they can do the eye of the needle. So, don't build something that is bigger and more difficult for the people to enter the kingdom. Number two, do not develop a philosophy of ministry that kindles suicidal desires of people. Paul said, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. But if you have food and clothing with this we will be content. But then he warned against the desire to be rich. And by implication, he warned against preachers who stir up the desire to be rich instead of helping people to get rid of it. He warned, First Timothy 6, verse 6 to 10, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's to this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and piercing themselves with many pants. So let's go to number three. Do not develop a philosophy of ministry that encourages vulnerability to mouth or rust. Jesus warns us at the effort to lay treasures on earth. That is, he tells us to be givers and not keepers. Do not lay, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, he says, where and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither mud nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6 verse 19. So when Jesus says it, I think that's sufficient. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing there to add by us. It's just that we can think about it and say, okay, this is something we like to do. Of course, everyone has his own reasons for not doing it and that's personal reasons and we have to set aside those reasons we have to um, we have to uh, how do you say that upside down our, our reasons instead of our reasons first the reasons for the Lord should be first and number four don't develop a philosophy of ministry that makes hard work a means of am amassing wealth. In itself, uh, amassing wealth, getting finance, getting money together by working for it, there's nothing wrong with it. There's, let me say that again. There's, nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. When you work hard and you make lo a lot of money, you can spend a lot of money. There's... That is what the, the economy is all about. Even the economy of the church and the economy of the, the kingdom of God. But, and that's important, Paul says, and that is what Jesus also says, that we should not steal. And, for example, the Ten Commandments says, well, you shall not steal. So I think it's clear that the, uh, the amassing of wealth should not come from stealing. The alternative to stealing is work with your, your own hands to raise money for yourself and for your family. Uh, you have to think about what am I going to do with the money I'm, uh, I'm making, I'm earning. The Bible teaches us, the Old Testament very specifically teaches us, when you give 10%, God will bless you. I think the blessing is still there. If you give 10% of your income, God will bless you. I don't see any uh, wrong, wrong thinking in this. The wrong thinking is from uh, some people say, okay, you have to give your 10% or your uh, tithes. And that is not true because... When you go back to the Old Testament, you find out that is specifically given to the priests and to the, uh, uh, the, temple, the temple itself. So that is where it should go. Since the temple isn't here anymore, or let me say it isn't there anymore in Jerusalem, so there's no temple, so we cannot give our tithes. Even if the temple was, was supposed to be there, um, then still we don't give our tithes and offerings anymore in that sense. Uh, by the way, the temple is there. Uh, for, for those who do not know, uh, a miniature version of the temple is standing not far away from the Dome of the Rock in a, in a plastic cover, but you can all see how the temple looks like. And so the temple, the literal sense, it's there. Of course, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot use it, and the, uh, uh, the inside of the temple is nothing. It's empty and uh, the Jews are not using it as such anyway. But I, I, I find that very in, interesting to see that the temple is there anyway. Okay, so um, giving money 
to support someone else, whether it's poor people, whether it's missionaries, whether it's the church or another uh, Christian ministry, there's nothing wrong with it. And um, in some cases, it's even so that God is blessing you so you can bless others. Again, that's a beautiful thing to do. We have this story of Mr. Underwood, the uh, manufacturer of uh, the typewriters with the name of Underwood, the brand name. That was his personal name. And uh, he was making so much money by manufacturing those typewriters <coughs> that he didn't need all the money he was getting. So he gave 90% of his income, he gave that away, and he, and he worked or he lived on 10%. So he lived on his tights, uh, and he gave away 90%. I'm not saying that everyone has to do the same thing, but it's just an example of how you can look at people who are Christians, devout Christians, and actually doing things for the Lord. He is blessed, and he blessed other people. And through him, many other people were blessed. Many people who do not even know, not even know the name of Underwood, were blessed by him because of his money. And that's, that's the right thing. Don't, uh, it, it's absolutely unnecessary for everyone to know who's given money. This, it, it's, it's, it's needed, the money itself is needed. Why should everyone know I give it? So we, I think that's a, a good example for all of us to look, at, uh, to look at us and say, okay, this is a fine thing to do. Number five. Don't develop a philosophy of ministry that promotes less faith in the promises of God to be for us what money can't be. The reason why Paul wrote in, uh, in Hebrews is that we have to be content, content with what we have, content with what God is giving us. But a number of people weren't happy with that. And they were not happy with yeah, the, the, the promises of God, let me say it that way. So in Hebrews 13, we read the following. Keep your life free from love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can a man do to me? Hebrews 6, uh, 13 to verses 5 to 6. So if the Bible tells us, that being content with what we have, honor or honors the promise of God, and God promises us never to forsake us. Well, why should we want to teach people to want to be rich? Because when you start teaching the opposite of what the Bible is teaching us, then what are you? Who are you? I don't want to be the judge over everyone who is trying to be rich and promising things to other people that they can be rich too and that is a blessing from God. I don't know. The blessing is that he will not forsake us, that he will not leave us. Number six, don't develop a philosophy of ministry that can it's to your uh, people being choked to death. Let me explain that a little bit. Jesus warns that the word of God, which is meant to give us life, 
can be choked off from the, uh, any effectiveness by riches. He says, it is like a seed that grows up among thorns that choke it to death. Luke 8, and let me quote, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the riches of life, and their fruit does not mature. Luke 8, verse 13. So seemingly, riches in itself is kind of neutral, but when it comes instead of God, or between you and God, then it's blocking you. It can be, it can be so uh, devastating that you can choke on it and that you can die from it. So I don't think we want to preach or we want to encourage anyone to preach something that goes against what the Bible is teaching us here.